Welcome to the course on Design and Analysis of Algorithms. Our topic today is Asymptotic Notation. Let me begin by setting down this topic in the context of our overall course goals. We said last time that one of the main course goals was to, well, first design algorithms. And then we want to analyze their time, analyze the time taken on the RAM model which we defined. We also said that the results of the analysis are not directly applicable. So there is some care needed in understanding how to interpret the time taken on the RAM model and how, how, to, how to use that to predict what happens on other computers. So for example, so in, the, in all this, we need some level of, uh, um, we need to be we we need to be a little bit imprecise. We need to throw away some details of our analysis in order to predict what happens on other computers. So the entire analysis, or what I really mean, the entire detailed analysis, not applicable. to other computers. We said that uh, suppose the time taken on the RAM was something like, say, 10 n cube plus 5 n squared plus 7, okay. then all that we can say for other computers is that the time is going to be cubic in n. However, the same conclusion would be arrived at, say, if the time was 2n cube plus 3n plus 79. Even here, our interpretation, our, our conclusions for the computers at large would be that the time taken is only cubic in n. So this is what our conclusions will be for any computer or all computers. So you see that we start off with a precise number over here, but over here we are going down to a very rough statement. And in some sense we are saying in all this that this function, this, this expression which we are going to think of as a function in n, n is the problem size. Okay. So this expression 10 n cube plus 5 n squared plus 7 and this expression or this function 2 n cube plus 3 n plus 79 are really in the same class. Okay. So we want to define the notion of classes of functions. Okay. So the idea is that we want to put functions in the same class and really think about the entire class. So our conclusion will be that instead of saying that the time taken is uh, 10 n cube plus 5 n squared plus 7, we really want to say something like cubic, but we want to be a lo lot more systematic and formal about it. So that's really the goal of today's lecture. So we would like to develop a notation which allows us to talk nicely about classes of functions. So asymptotic notation. Okay, so is a formal, formal way or a formal notation to speak, speak about functions and classify them. Asymptotic analysis refers to the question of classifying functions. Okay. Or classifying, cl classifying the behavior of anything 
but in this in this uh, not not too precisely but by putting them into classes so let me start out by writing down what do we need from the classes that we are going to define so we want really two kinds of features okay so one we would like to put okay functions such as say 10 in cube plus 5 in squared plus 17 and 2 in cube plus 3n plus 79 should belong to the same class. Because we said that in some sense we are going to be classifying these as cubic and we want them to get together. Another way of saying this is that constant multipliers should be ignored. So the constant multiplier over here is 10, the constant multiplier over here is 2. So we are going to ignore that and that is our desire because eventually what we can really say is that the time taken on the RAM is this, then the time taken on any computer has to have form like something times NQ. Okay, so we want, we want a class notation which allows us to nicely ignore constant multipliers. Okay. Our class notation should also really worry about what happens as n tends to infinity. So we should give more importance to behavior as n tends to infinity. So this also is seen in this example itself as n tends to infinity really the 5n squared plus 17 and this 3n plus 79 these two parts of these functions will go out and therefore we will really be worrying about 10 n cube versus 2 n cube. And then our first property or first feature which we said we want in our class definition will take over and it will say that really 10 n cube and 2 n cube are really the same thing. So that's the spirit. Okay. So we want a notation, a class notation which will allow us to conclude that say functions of this kind are really similar or are in the same class. So let me give an outline of today's lecture. Okay, so we are going to define three main kinds of notation today. So one is the theta notation, one is the O notation, okay, this is the capital or the big O. And then there is the omega notation. And these will define function classes and they will do exactly what we said we want. And we will have lots of examples throughout but at the end we will also have a series of examples. So let's go in order and let me start off with the theta notation. So in what follows we are going to have functions say something like f and g and these functions are always going to be say non-negative functions and say non, yeah, non-negative which will take non-negative values. functions of non-negative arguments. Okay, this is natural in the sense that we are going to be talking about uh, time or maybe sometimes the memory or any kind of resource and these values will not really, uh, th there won't be any occasion when functions will need to take negative values. Okay, so now theta of g, where remember g is a function, is the following class. 
So, it is the class of all functions f where, okay, so let me write that down. So, f is a non negative function. such that there exist constants c1, c2 and n0 such that c1 times g of n is less than or equal to f of n less than or equal to c2 times g of n. Okay? And this is true not necessarily for all values of n, but certainly for n greater than or equal to n naught. Okay, so this is a bit of a big definition, but let me just indicate the spirit of it. Okay. So let us go back to the properties that we wanted. So we, we said that whenever whatever class structure we define should give importance to behavior as n tends to infinity. Okay, so, this is the part of the behavior, this is the part of that requirement. We are saying that for only, that we are only really bothered about what happens as n is bigger than some n naught. Okay, so, we are not worried about smaller values of n. Then we said that we should really not be worrying so much about constant multipliers. Okay. So, this is also what is going on over here. So, it says that we want f of n to be sandwiched between c1 times g of n and c2 times g of n. Okay, so, let me draw a picture here. So, if this is, this is where I plot the function values and this is n. Okay. Then c1 times g of n will look something like this. Say in general, it is going to be something like this is c1 times g of n. Okay, this is going to be c2 times g of n and let us say this is n naught. Then our claim, our, our requirement is that if f occupies this region entirely and does not go be beyond this region, go outside this region, okay, this is the region for f, okay, somewhere inside, anywhere inside. Okay, so then it is sandwiched between c1 times g of n and c2 times g of n. Then we will put f in the class theta times g. So, notice that we are not caring what happens if for, for values of n below. Over here, f could go outside this, that is okay, we are not worried about that. But beyond n naught, f must only lie between this sandwich region. So, essentially we are saying that we do not worry about what that constant factor is. Okay, so, it is bracketed below by some multiple of g, it is bracketed above by another multiple of g. So, essentially it behaves like g and that for large n. So, that is exactly that is exactly in the, uh, the uh, consistent with the features that we wanted. So, let us take a few examples. Let us take our two functions which we uh, with which we started. Okay. So, I will write down say f of n equals or let me call it f 1 n equals say 10 n cube plus 5 n squared plus 17. Then this function belongs to theta of n cube. Okay. Let me write down, I will prove this, but let me write down the other claim as well. So, let me write f 2 of n, another function which is say 2 n cube plus 3 n plus 79 and this also belongs to the same class n cube. So, I just want to reassure you that the goals with which we started, namely de developing a uh, class notation which will enable us to put these two functions in the same class, okay, are that, those, that goal is actually being met. Okay, so, let me now say in on what basis I am concluding something like this. So, let me go back to the definition. Okay, so, in order to classify a function as being a member of this, of this uh, class of functions, this set of functions, okay, all I need to do is to, uh, uh, is to find suitable constants c1, c2 and n0. 
So if I find these suitable uh, constants C1, C2, and not such that these properties are met, then I am really done. So let's take one. Okay, so uh, let me write this down as proof of one. <coughs> so clearly, ten n cube is less than or equal to f one n. Okay, because there is a, that additional five n squared plus seventeen term. Okay, and I can write down f one of n is certainly less than. I will just raise all these to n cubes instead of keeping them uh, n to the zero and n squared over here. So this is certainly less than ten plus five plus seventeen times n cube, or this is equal to twenty-two n cube or thirty-two n cube really. Okay, and this is true for all n. So I have established that if I take c one equals ten. And C two equals thirty two, then C one times n cube is less than or equal to F one of n, less than or equal to C two of n, for all n greater than or equal to say even one doesn't really matter. So these constants C one, C two, and n, and one is equal to n not have been found. And we know that the functions and these constants satisfy the properties that we wanted, and therefore we can legitimately claim that f1 belongs to this class. Okay, so the conclusion from this is that f1 belongs to the class n cube. And in fact, the same kind of analysis will enable us to prove that f2 also belongs to the same class. Let me take one more example, okay, which actually illustrates. That our our notation is a bit more is going beyond what we really started off. Okay. So I'm going to I, I'm going to argue now. So that suppose I take f three of n is equal to ten n cube plus say n log n. Okay. Then even this is in the class theta of n cube. This is not something that you would classify as being cubic, right? Okay, because cubic has the connotation of cubic polynomial, so it has to it has to have the form something times n cube plus something times n squared plus something times n plus a constant. Whereas here there is something funny that is there is a, a term which is not a polynomial term. However, note that. It still is true that ten n cube is less than or equal to f three of n, because n log n is certainly always uh, at least zero, or certainly greater than zero, in fact. And in fact, I can, since I know that n log n is less than n cube, I can also write this as less than or equal to eleven n cube. So I have found c one equals ten, c two equals eleven, and say n not equals one. For which my definition holds, and therefore I can rightfully claim that this function f3 also belongs to the class n cube. Okay. So this is a good idea. It, it, it is good that in fact this function belongs to this class n cube, because as as n increases, as n tends to infinity, then this function really is the same as 10 n cube essentially, because this term is going to be. Going to be negligible as for large n as compared to this term, and so therefore, since it is essentially the same as n cube, it is a good thing that our classification system is putting it in the same class. Let me write down a few more examples. Okay. Actually, before that, let us come back to this uh, definition itself. So, so theta of g is a set of functions or a class of functions, and we are going to think of g as being sort of a representative, or g as being sort of a prototypical function. Okay. So instead of talking about a very detailed function like say 10 n cube plus n log n, okay, or 10 n cube plus 5 n squared plus 17, we will say we are roughly going to say that it is n cube. If we are ignoring constant factors, and as n goes to infinity, and we will instead be saying that. It is 
the, the class theta of n cube. So think of G also as a representative of all, this, all these functions. Okay, so let's take a few more examples. Okay, so I'll write down maybe that 5n log n okay, plus 10n okay, belongs to the class theta of n log n. Okay. So the important point over here is that this 10n is grows slower, right? So as, as n becomes large, this term is going to dominate this term. And therefore, its behavior should be essentially the same as that of n log n. Okay? And therefore, it's in the same class. We should really prove this, and I will leave that as an exercise. We should really prove that a function of n, which is 5n log n plus 10n, belongs to this class theta of n log n. And by that, I mean you should exhibit constant c1, c2, and n naught such that c1 times n log n is less than or equal to this which in turn is less than or equal to c2 times n log n for all n greater than the n naught that you find. So that's a fairly, fairly easy task, but you should certainly do it so as to make sure that you are fully conversant with this definition. Okay. Let's take a slightly more complicated, but complicated looking example. So let's say we have a polynomial a of n, which goes something like, say, summation i going from 0 to k, of a i uh, a i n to the power i. Okay? And let's assume that a k is greater than 0. Okay? Other terms could be smaller, but a k is bigger than 0. Then I'll claim that this function a of n, okay, in general, any polynomial of kth degree okay, is in the class theta of n to the power k. Again, you should prove this, okay, but this proof is really similar to what we have done earlier, and th there should not be any difficulty whatsoever. Okay, again, the message is the same, that if you have a function, you look at the most, the largest term in it, and that really is its class. That's, that really is its asymptotic complexity class. Let me now write down some properties of this definition. Okay. So suppose we have f belonging to theta of g1 and say h belonging to theta of g2. Then I claim that f plus h belongs to theta of g1 plus g2. Okay. This also you should be able to verify, fairly straightforward. Okay. And furthermore, if say g1 is the same as g2, then f plus h, okay. when I write f plus h, I really mean f of n plus h of n, okay. the function which returns for every n f of n plus h of n, and this function belongs to theta of g. Okay. This is also understandable because if you believe the previous result, Okay, so g1 plus g1 equal to g2 equal to g. Okay, so g1 plus g2 will be equal to twice g. And the class 2 in cube, theta of 2 in cube, is really the same as the class theta of n cube. Again, you should be able to verify this. You should verify this. And it's really not surprising because we started off by saying that we really don't want to worry about constant factors. And therefore, it does make sense, or it should make sense, to have theta of n cube be the same as theta of 2 n cube. We, however, never ever write theta of 2 n cube, and that's because it's much simpler and much nicer to say theta of n cube. So when we write theta of g, we don't, we drop off the constant multipliers, if any, that might be present in g. So we have defined the first class of functions that we wanted, and it does indeed, it is indeed consistent with uh, our intuition and the goals we set ourselves. However, although this is a class of functions, in computer science and mathematics, there is a funny style evolved as far as writing down this, these classes is concerned. So let me write that. Let me let me write that down. So 
I am going to write down a note on writing style. Okay. So, suppose f is sorry f belongs to the class theta of g. Okay. Now, very often or most commonly this is not written in this manner, but the more common writing style is is to write f is equal to theta of g. Unfortunately, the assignment operator is again being badly abused over here. Okay. This seems to be a tradition in computer science. We use assignment to mean, we use the equal to operator to mean assignment. We use it to mean, uh, well, first of all, it's, it has the value uh, uh, equality, then it has this value, uh, it has, it it is used to indicate assignment and here we are actually using it to denote set inclusion. However, you will, you will see that you will not really be bothered by this. It will become very clear by the context that this is what we mean. Actually, the situation is really similar to our uh, use of English language words. So, for example, we might write a rose is red. When we write this, we really mean that a rose belongs to the class of red things or the set of red things. So, as you can see, even in the English language, the verb is is used to indicate equality. Okay. That is perhaps the more common use, but it is also used to indicate some kind of set inclusion. So anyway, instead of saying f belongs to theta of g, it is very common to say f equals theta of g. We never, however, write theta of g equal to f. This is never written. Okay. Just as it doesn't make sense to say red, well, I guess in poetic English it does make sense to say red is rose, but we never write this in, in, uh, in computer science. I will add one more note on writing style. So, I have been writing functions as functions by their names directly. So, I might write something like f equals theta of g, but from time to time I might also write f of n is equal to theta of g of n if n is sort of an understood, n is clearly understood as an unbound variable, the argument, the possible argument that f can take. So, these two really will be, think of these as being the same. Okay. This, I might write it in this manner just to emphasize the fact that f is a function, but if it is clear that f is a function, then I am, it might be good to write it in this manner. Let me take one more example. Let me define f 5 of n as 2 plus 1 over n. So, what can we, what class can we put this in? So, it turns out that there is actually a nice class into which we can put this and this class is simply the theta of one class. Okay. So, here let us say g of n is always equal to 1 and then we have to argue that in fact f 5 belongs to theta of g. Okay, which is what I have written down over here. Let us just do this just to make sure, ju just, uh, just to make sure we understand this. So, clearly 2 is less than or equal to 2 plus 1 over n, which is equal to f 5 of n. Okay. And in fact, this is less than or equal to say 3. Okay. And therefore, we have c 1 equals 2, c 2 equals 3, and this is true for all n. So, we can have n naught equals 1 and we have these three constants satisfying our uh, basic definition of theta okay. and therefore, we can write f 5 as belonging to theta of 1. Okay. So, theta of 1 is the class of all functions which are essentially constant. Okay. They, may, they may have some minor perturbations, but they really are like constants. 
So now we will come back, we will come to our other two definitions, okay. uh, the, our other two classes and we will define those. Okay. So the first class is O of G. Okay. So this is a class of functions F okay, such that okay, where F is a non-negative function. And there exist, there exists C two and N naught such that f of n is less than or equal to C two times G of n for all n greater than N naught. Okay. Omega of G is the same thing as above. So it is f, but so f is non-negative. Okay, but now we are worried about c1 and n naught. Okay, such that f of n is less than sorry, c1 times g of n is less than or equal to f of n, and we do not have anything on the upper bound for all n greater than n naught. And let me just refresh you what the theta of G definition was. The only difference was that we wanted there to exist C1, C2 and N0 such that C1 times G of N is less than F of N and is less than C2 times G of N. So you can see that the class omega relaxes one of the conditions which was present in the class theta and so does O. O relaxes the lower bound condition and omega relaxes the upper bound condition. So in omega the lower bound condition is present but we are not saying anything about whether f of n is above uh, f of n is bounded above by some g. Okay. Most often in algorithm analysis we find it is easy, it is reasonably easy to say that the time taken is at most something like this, at most this function. So for example, in last lecture, in the last lecture we said something like, if we look at this uh, program and we count the number of iterations, then we can certainly argue that there are at most n cube iterations or something like that and therefore the time taken has to be at most cubic in n. Okay. There, we later on did argue that the time has to be at least cubic, but suppose we, ha we just had argued that it was at most cubic. Then we would have used this O notation. So we would have said that the time taken belongs to O of n cube. Okay, so let me write that down. So if we know, say that time taken as a function of n is less than or equal to say 15 n cube plus 17 plus 7 n squared plus 35 or something like that, then we can conclude that T of n belongs to O of n cube. Okay. If in addition we prove that T of n is also greater than say 2 n cube plus 37, then this would imply, let us go back to our definition, okay, so let, let me put it on top, okay, so let us see, okay. okay. So here we are, we are establishing that T of n is bigger than 2 n cube plus 37, okay, or I can write this as say, 2n cube is less than or equal to t of n, so which is exactly the condition that we wanted over here and therefore we could argue that t of n belongs to the class omega of n cube. Okay. Over here, okay, in the first case, In the first case we said 
the T of we know that T of n is less than 15 n cube plus 7 n squared plus 35 and which I can write down as in fact less than 35 plus 7 plus 15. So, 57 n cube and that is really satisfying this condition and therefore, I can conclude that T of n is, is belonging to this class. But what happens as a result of both of these? Okay. So, I have really established that this T of n is bounded below by C 1 times G of n simply this 2 n cube and it is bounded above by C 2 times G of n which is simply this 57 n cube. Okay. So, as a result what has happened is that I can conclude from both of these two things that T of n is belong uh, T of n belongs to theta of n cube as well. Okay. So, let me let me make th this point again because it is an important point. Okay. The class O of G is the class of functions okay, which are bounded above by G. So, if we know something about something about what is bigger than these than the function that we are uh, considering. Okay. So, if we know a function which is bigger then we can say we can put it put the unknown function in this class in this O of G class. Okay. So, if you know an upper bound on a function then then we should be looking at expressing that upper bound as O of G. If we know a lower bound on that function we should be looking at expressing this knowledge as this f belongs to omega of G. And if we know both upper bound and lower bounds in terms of the same function G then we should write that this function f belongs to theta of g. Okay. So, as you must have already guessed the class theta of g is simply the union of the classes O of g I am sorry the intersection of the classes O of g and omega of g. So, let us let us take some examples of O. So, say something like 3 n squared belongs to O n squared. Okay. 3 n squared in fact belongs to theta of n squared and therefore, it certainly belongs to O of n squared because O of n squared in fact is uh, bigger than theta of n squared. Okay. Here is another example. So, say 10 n cube plus 5 n plus 7 belongs to O of n cube. Okay. Similar logic, but something like 10 n cube plus 5 n plus 7 also, to also belongs to O of n to the fourth. Why is this? Because 10 n cube plus 5 n plus 7 is less than or equal to I can certainly write this as being less than or equal to say 32 n to the fourth and that is all my definition of O really cares about. So, this also belongs to this this function belongs to this class. Okay. No surprise that you should not be surprised by this because we are really saying that G serves like an upper bound on this function and if I can if if n cube is an upper bound then certainly n fourth is an upper bound as well. Okay, so, let me summarize that f belongs to theta of g should be read as f is nearly the same or let me write as similar to g. f belongs to O of g should be read as f dominated by g or actually not dominated f is no larger than g ok sort of like less than or equal to, but it is not exactly less than or equal to because we are ignoring constants just as this is sort of like equal to f belongs to omega of g 
likewise should be thought of as f greater than or equal to g okay but again we are ignoring constants and also lower order terms okay. so we now have defined our three main function classes theta of g o of g or also called big o of g and omega of g i have defined these classes in the context of the times taken by algorithms but of course these are just plain old function classes and the functions could denote not necessarily the time taken but any old thing okay. so for example let me define a general function okay which just is the sum of the first n numbers so let me say s of n is equal to summation i going from 1 to n of i itself well you do know from say uh, some of the mathematics courses that you have done that s of n is nothing but n into n plus 1 upon 2 however getting to a result like this requires some amount of cleverness this results this result is a very precise result if you prove that s of n is is exactly this it is a very precise result but sometimes you might say you might not have enough time or you might not have enough cleverness to get an exact result like this which is to say that s of n is exactly n into n plus 1 upon 2 but suppose you are, you might be happy with a weaker results okay so you might want to know well does s of n grow or does s of n belong to n squared into the into the class uh, to the class theta of n squared or does it belong to the class theta of n at first glance just by looking at this it should it is not clear at all whether s of n belongs to the class theta of n squared or whether it belongs to class to the class theta of n cubed or anything like that so what i want to stress or what i want to give an example of right now is that even without getting to this exact expression you might be able to determine the class to which a function belongs and in fact we are going to prove that s of n belongs to the class theta of n squared without actually calculating s of n precisely and this is this is an instructive example because something like this will happen when we anal analyze algorithms so s of n is equal to summation i going from 1 to n of i but note that this i is always going to be at most n and therefore i can write this as summation i going from 1 to n of n itself but what is this this is just n plus n plus n n times because every term in this sum is n and therefore this is nothing but n squared so what have we established we have established that s of n is less than or equal to n squared but that right away puts s in the class o of n squared so this implies that s of n belongs to the class o of n squared can we argue that s of n belongs to the class omega of n squared that's what we are going to do next okay so again we'll observe something very sim very simple so s of n is summation i going from 1 to n of of i now i'm going to ignore the first n over 2 terms okay so this certainly is greater than or equal to if i ignore the first n over 2 terms this is going to be i going from say n over 2 plus 1 to n of i itself but not but now note that this i is always going to be at least n over 2 because it starts at n over 2 and goes all the way till n so therefore i can write this as summation i going from n over 2 to 2 plus 1 to n of n over 2 itself okay so term by term this series this sum is bigger than the corresponding term over here okay. but what is this this is simply n by 2 added to itself n by 2 times okay so and therefore i will write this as equal to n by 2 times n by 2 which is n squared by 4 so i have argued that s of n is bigger than or equal to n squared by 4 and at most n squared so we have bracketed s of n okay well before that 
just when once we argue that s of n is bigger than n squared by 4, we can conclude that s of n belongs to omega of n squared. Just going back to our definition, we have proved that, okay, let's just let's just do this once. So we need to argue that f of n, which is s of n now, is greater than or equal to n squared by 4. Okay? And the c1 now is 1 by 4, but that's okay. We, we, don't, we didn't necessarily say, we didn't say over here that c1 has to be greater than 1 or anything like that. Any real number, any positive real number is fine. There exists, I should write this as, there exists c1 on n0 positive, okay? all through. All the c1 n0 that I have written should be positive. Okay. That's what that's exactly what we have proved over here. S of n. So we have argued that S of n belongs to n squared as well. And from this and this, what can I conclude? Well, from those two things, I can conclude that S of n must be theta of n squared as well. Okay. So notice that in doing any of this, I did not actually exactly evaluate S of n. In this case, evaluating S of n exactly is possible, but very, very often it is not. As I said, it may require exceptional cleverness once in a while to exactly evaluate a function. But giving bounds on it is easy, and the bounds on it can be nicely stated in terms of the class notation that we have right now. So if we know an upper bound, we can state it as s of n belongs to O of something. If you know a lower bound, we can state it as s of n belongs to omega of something. And if we know both, we can state s of n as theta of something. In this manner, I would like you to prove, okay, so let me write this down as homework, prove that say t of n, if t of n is equal to uh, summation i going from 1 to n of say i squared, then prove that t of n belongs to theta of n cubed. The proof is really more or less identical, but you should, pers but again you should persuade yourself of this. Let me take one more example. Okay. So let us look at the Fibonacci series, which is defined by f of n equals f of n minus 1 plus f of n minus 2 and f of 1 equals f of 0 equals 1. Let me claim that f of n is always uh, greater than or equal to 2 to the power n by 2. Okay? This is also homework. What can you conclude from this? You can conclude from this that f of n is in omega of 2 to the n by 2. Okay, let me make one more claim. Okay. Okay, well, let me not make that claim. Let me instead tell you the real result, okay, actual result. It is possible to show that f of n is theta of 1 plus root 5 upon 2 whole to the power n. Okay? So it is not exactly this number, but it is within a constant multiplier of this. Okay? The nth Fibonacci number is within a constant multiplier of this. Okay? Proving this exact bound takes a lot more work. But by something really simple, we have at least argued that f of n is actually going to grow at least as 2 to the n by 2, or in fact, I can write this as omega of root 2 to the n. Okay. So something like this is commonly called exponential growth. Okay. So by, very, by a very easy logic, by very easy reasoning, we can argue that the Fibonacci numbers grow exponentially. 
by more complicated reasoning and by reasoning which involves essentially involves finding out a precise formula for the nth term, we can get a much tighter results. But the importance right now is that our theta notation and our omega notation allow us to express our knowledge or lack of it in a very compact manner. So let me summarize now. So one, we have defined theta, O and omega notation. Okay, so these capture the idea that ignore, ignore constant multipliers, consider n goes to infinity, which is equivalent to saying that ignore, okay, consider leading terms. So our time estimates of algorithms will be expressed using these notations. The second thing that I want to uh, mention is that in fact this notation is just, uh, is just a general notation on functions and it can be used for other things as well and sometimes and it, it really allows us to, to express what we know and what we do not know in a very compact manner. So even if we don't know, even if we know a little bit about it, then we can put it in a certain class and that this, this partial information that we have can be nicely expressed. Okay? So this is useful for thinking about functions in general. Thank you.